Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. We have a special guest this week, Senator Mike Lee of Utah, the author of a new book called Our Lost Declaration. We're going to talk about rabble rouser of Thomas Paine. We're going to talk about the rage against the machine of King George III and how all of this applies to the bottom-up ethos that created America and, and your responsibility to make sure it doesn't go away. Check it out. They have, um, like a lot of bands apparently practice in that church. What's that good acoustic? So it's not just, um, it's not, not just gospel. It's, it's not just gospel music. It's, uh, there's some pretty heavy stuff coming out of there on cool. Saturday. Uh, Senator Mike Lee, um, first of all, we should acknowledge the, the glamorous life of a U.S. Senator. It is Easter Sunday. It is. And you just did uh, Face the Nation on CBS. And now you're doing this, and, and then you're headed to New York. So um, people should at least appreciate the fact that it's not all like uh, champagne and roses for you guys. No. It, well, for me personally, it's never champagne. It's never Sometimes champagne. roses, but never champagne. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, look, um, this is a lot of work. Uh, uh, this line of work isn't something you want to go into if you want to pleasure cruise. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and you have, have always sort of like, uh, put the job and the principles ahead of, of party and on this Easter Sunday and ahead of, ahead of your family. And, and those are, those are real sacrifices that actual public servants, and there are a few, um, people at least need to appreciate. And I, I, I hate to say nice things about politicians, but, but I'm, I'm at least throwing you a bone on this particular day. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's, it's certainly a big sacrifice on the part of my wife and our three children, and uh, grateful to them for supporting me in this job, but it's not without sacrifice. So we're here to, uh, um, when this airs, um, just in a couple days, your new book, Our Lost Declaration, nice camera shot there. Um, this will be out. And, and this is basically the third in a trilogy, and, and, and I'm going to argue that you probably need to read all of them eventually, but, but I might actually start with this one, and we'll get into this. But before, before we get into this book, and, and where can we buy this book again? Well, you can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it through Barnes & Noble, almost anywhere where books are, are sold. Uh, it'll be uh, uh, on sale as of April 23rd. Now, you see... Um, you can tell that I've done this a long time because the product placement is so subtle that no one would even know that I'm flacking right, this book. Right, it was yeah. seamless. Yeah, uh, it was totally in, seamless. In fact. Um, but before we get into the book, let's, uh, let's give people a little bit of a history lesson about you um, because I, I remember I was, I was talking about a speech that you had given that I'll, that I'll probably get into. Um, it was like a Federalist Society speech or something like that. And I was I was telling this to one of my, my one of my colleagues and investors, and he said to me, um, "Mike Lee's a lawyer." He didn't know that, and he's he's a big fan of yours. So I, I'd I'd love for people to know a little bit about your history because you've been you've been swimming in the deep end of constitutional thought since you were uh, a kid. Uh, what's give us a little bit of that? Yeah, I I grew up in a home where we talked about the law. A lot. And by, by the way, on, on that comment, Mike Lee's a lawyer. I don't know whether to be uh, flattered or insulted. I think I'm mostly flattered by the idea that... It wasn't meant as, as a pejorative in that particular sure. sentence, sure. But, but normally it would be. But nobody likes lawyers. Yeah. I mean, uh, as my dad used to say, it's a shame when you allow an entire profession's reputation to be sullied on the basis of only eight or 900,000 bad apples. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm a third generation lawyer. Uh, my son James is now in law school. He'll, he'll be a fourth generation lawyer. And um, in the home in which I was raised, we talked a lot about the Constitution. We talked about it around the dinner table. We talked about it as we were driving to the grocery store. It's just what we did. I don't think I knew there was anything unusual about that until I was about 30 and looked back on it and realized not everybody does that. But they should. Yes. Yeah. That's why I wrote this book. And, uh, and, and give us some of your resume. You, you clerked for Supreme Court Justice Alito. And uh, what else? You've done a lot of legal beagle stuff. Yeah, so I, I served as a law clerk at all three levels of the federal judiciary. 
uh, worked for a federal district judge, uh, the Honorable D. Benson, at the U.S. District Court for the District of Utah. Then I, I clerked for uh, then Judge Alito on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and clerked for him again after he got himself put on the U.S. Supreme Court. I was an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, federal prosecutor for a couple years. I also served as the general counsel to Utah's governor, uh, Governor John Huntsman. And then in private practice, I specialized primarily in appellate and uh, uh, Supreme Court litigation. So one thing that, that dawned on me when I was reading this book, I, I think if you actually want to understand how Mike Lee thinks about the world, this one's probably more important. And you've, and, and you've written two other books in this trilogy, I guess five total books. Yeah. But, but these three, I feel like you're sort of revealing to the entire world sort of how you process facts and, and debates before Congress. Um, and you would think Our Lost Constitution would be, would, would be your book, which was the first. And then Written Out of History was, a, was a, a story about people we don't know that had a profound influence on, on America's founding. And of course, this is about the founding generation. And, and, and what I would argue is sort of the, the bottom-up, grassroots, populist, almost egalitarian push against the king that, that was the, 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 the foment during the colonial years. Um, but why, why, why did you write this book? And, and do you view it as part of a, a trilogy? Yes, I definitely do view it as part of a trilogy. And I, I also agree with you. I think of the, the three books in that trilogy, this is the one to read first. In some respects, looking back, I wonder whether I should have written this one first. But yeah. hey, uh, better to uh, get it done than not get it done at all, even if it's in, in a different order. But this book really talks about what set it all in motion. Uh, it, the Constitution uh, sets up a framework for us to operate. But the Declaration of Independence and the events that led to it really set in motion uh, the cause of liberty in the United States of America. And if we understand the Declaration better, I think it will help us approach the Constitution in a more respectful, sustainable manner. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of debate about the legitimacy of, of the Constitution uh, because of some of the failings of the founders, and, and maybe we'll get into that. Um, but you're, the, the, the thing that you do that, that I like so much in this book is, is taking that, you know, to the extent that people under, remember the Declaration of Independence, they, they, they remember the opening lines, life, liberty, and the pursuit of right. happiness, uh, which is a pretty good line. Like, I, 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 could, I can sign off on that. But, but the part that you talk about that, that's sort of forgotten is that middle part, raging against the king, raging against this, this top-down, faraway um, authoritarian state that, that's sort of trampling on the rights of individuals here um, in the colonies. Um, why don't we talk about that part? We need to. And it's why I wrote this book. Is we don't talk about uh, the, the, what I call the indictment section. So there's the, the sort of introductory or preambular language that people are most familiar with in the Declaration. Then you've got the, the part I refer to as the indictment against King George III, the, the list of grievances. It's sort of like our Festivus moment, uh, airing of grievances against King George III. And then uh, it culminates in, in our actually leaving Great Britain. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I focus um, a lot of this book on our airing of grievances against King George III. Because we see, when we study this part of it, that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Human nature still is the same today as it was 250 years ago when all this was starting to unfold. And it's important for us to realize that human nature still being the same, still should cause us the same concerns about government. Government doesn't simply become holy over time or incorruptible. Government itself is the product of what individual human beings do, and we've got to protect uh, the public at large from what government can do when it's left unrestrained. So I have this, uh, I have this theory that um, I would actually consider myself a populist, even though that's, that's a loaded term, and uh, part of my mission in life is to take back some words and meanings that have been corrupted, but... Um, to me, populism is is just that rage against the machine, sort of that that righteous anger when when concentrated power, particularly in the hands of government, is used to to stop people from making choices for themselves. And that that was 
the founding ethos. That was the rage against the machine that, that was not, it didn't start with George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. It started with the people, with, with, a, with a heavy shout out from, from Thomas Paine. Exactly. It, it, Thomas Paine took something that was developing in the uh, American mindset and he channeled it. He channeled it exceptionally well channeled it better than anyone else did. And, you know, when, when you address, adjust for changes in population, um, Thomas Paine's common sense uh, was the best seller, not only of its time, but ever in American history. Uh, it was wildly popular in part because he was expressing something that needed to be expressed, that people felt but didn't know how to put words to. Yeah, And he, he was himself embracing a, a populist ideology, one that recognized that the people are the sovereigns and that there's no reason to just give blind deference to a king. Yeah. And he was uh, um, heavily influenced by classical thinkers that we would think a lot of like John Locke. Um, but but what's different, and I, I, I think this is where your history as, as a Tea Party, or a, I don't know if it was, but it feels like it was influenced by Thomas Paine because he was, he stuck his neck out first. He, he, was, he, was, a, uh, he was a member of the media. Um, and and originally published Common Sense without putting his name to it because it would have been, it, he would have been hung for for doing it. Um, but in fact, it was very difficult for him to even find a publisher yeah. willing to publish it, and, and he had to agree that he would cover any liabilities sustained by the publisher as a result of it. Yeah, and it, it, uh, interesting times. So both he and his publisher were really taking a grave risk. Right. I feel like um, his publisher probably deserves some credit as well because I don't think legal costs would have been the issue. Um, right. Yeah. Right. It's more <laughs> loss of one's head. Right. Than loss of one's wealth. Yeah. You can't. You can't reattach that. Uh, last I've last I've checked, you can't. Yeah. But but Thomas Paine, like he 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 didn't use uh, he didn't use all these these fancy words that that sometimes we use constitutional conservatives libertarians we we love to geek out and and particularly you lawyer types i mean you yeah, sorry and, and you're you're occasionally guilty of this yourself you you're, you're i've heard you're quoting <laughs> you're quoting uh, uh sections of the constitution which which no one's ever read before and 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 we missed that but he was he was just, he was speaking emotionally rationally but emotionally and passionately and and radically, that's that's something that that's why he galvanized the public. Yes, and he galvanized it because he took a common set of assumptions that had been embraced wholeheartedly by Englishmen everywhere, and yeah. that included the British subjects on American soil. A common set of assumptions about the divine right of kings, about the fact that the, the King George the Third had every right uh, uh, ordained and and. Uh, 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 conceived by God himself uh, to rule and that the American people and British sub subjects everywhere were, were just expected to defer to that. And he asked the question, why? Why should we do that? And he pointed out a whole lot of reasons why people shouldn't. So even though we don't have a king today, we do have a government, and that's a government in which people would put an artificial and creepily, eerily, uh, almost religious amount of faith in. Yeah, that's wrong. We shouldn't be doing that. Well, it, uh, there is an analogy here because the, the the detachment that you felt from the king back then, from a foreign land, someone that you would never meet, never get to talk to, um, it, 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 in many ways an abstraction, is exactly like what we call the deep state or the administrative state, this, this, this blob of gray-suited Soviets who decide... Um, and, and it's not like you would ever get a day in court to engage them if you are the victim of that kind of thing. It's, it's the same thing, except it's even harder to pinpoint than a king. That's right. It's much easier to take down a king when you can name the individual person who, in, in whom is vested all of this power. Yeah. But when that power is spread out among tens of thousands of people, potentially hundreds of thousands of people, depending on who you regard as wielding uh, authority within the deep state, it's much harder to take that person down. A and instead, what you're left with is this broad abstraction that the federal government is good, that it does good things. There, there's a cultural 
dynamic at play in America uh, that has been at play for several decades in which people assume if you identify a problem, the next logical step is going to be, let's have the federal government do it. Yeah. And they've developed this creepy trust and faith and confidence in the government, a government that can build these impressive war machines, aircraft carriers, uh, fighter jets, things like that. And, and it develops, it becomes almost awe-inspiring. We have to be careful that we not worship the state simply because we respect or fear the state in some respects. Yeah, and you, in, your, in your introduction, you call out our progressive friends who, who put that sort of unbridled faith in the system and, and all, all of these faceless people that um, you, you, they can't be fired, they can't be held to account. It's even hard sometimes to figure out who they are. Um, that to me is sort of the Achilles heel of, of the, the progressive aspiration to sort of rationally plan things from the top down. Especially because they're experts. Yes. So in addition to the fact that this is a somewhat diffused power, uh, it's, it's concentrated in all the wrong ways. It's diffused also in all the wrong ways. And then it's rendered immune from certain types of criticism by virtue of the fact that they're experts. These are the, the scientists who know what they're doing in, in regulating X, Y, or Z. And so we, we have to have faith and confidence and trust in, in them. And by the way, if you don't share that faith and confidence and trust in them, uh, you're foolish. Yeah, you're foolish. And, and since we've picked on lawyers, I'm an economist by training, and, and a lot of, of current economics has that pretense that, that Hayek worked about. Um, by the way, you don't have to partake in this, but apparently every time I say Hayekian, our viewers have to drink. So um, I wish I had a drink here, but water... Water's okay too. Well, oh, I thought that qualified. Yeah. That. Well, it's it's okay. Um, but the uh, you know what would Thomas Paine say about about that progressive pretense? I'm always reluctant to speak for any other human being, and I'm especially reluctant to speak for one who's not here to defend himself. But I will say this: I have a hunch that if Thomas Paine were here, he would say, "What are you doing? Why have you exchanged one form?" of centralized power for another? Why have you given away this much of your liberty, this much of your lives, of your ability to uh, provide for your families to one central government? So your capital is no longer in London, but it's in Washington. You're no longer headed by a king, but you've got a different type of sovereign at play. And that sovereign is disrespecting the sovereignty of the people, which is what's most important. So you call him a... Uh, populists and an, an egalitarian. Um, tell me, tell me what Thomas Paine would, how he would explain that position. Thomas Paine grew up in England in a village where he routinely saw abuses of government power. He saw people hanged. He saw people mistreated uh, by the king's servants. And this was deeply upsetting to him. And he noticed that this often disproportionately affected poor and middle class Englishmen. And this strongly affected his mindset. And it's one of the reasons why he was able to channel this uh, populist feeling so effectively when he got to the United States of America. The fact that he ended up here, having been encouraged to come here uh, by Benjamin Franklin, uh, uh, was itself uh, the outgrowth of populist thinking. And then when he got here and he got into the publishing industry, he decided it was time to set the record straight on liberty and on the blind deference people were giving to King George III. And he, he didn't really want to do it. He was, he was trying to run a business. He was trying to actually provide for himself, um, but he just couldn't take it anymore. He felt compelled to do this, yeah. even though he knew the risks were great and even though he had to take his name off of it and beg and plead with different publishers until he finally found one under limited circumstances willing to publish this tract. But he did it. And once he, once he dropped that lit match and it met with this dry, vast bed of tinder, it caught fire very quickly. Yeah. I, you know, I hadn't noticed this, the, the, how radical this quote was until you pointed out in your book. And I wrote it down because I wanted to get it right. He, Thomas Paine in common sense, that says the cause of America is the cause of mankind. Um, it it sounds pretty pretentious. What what did he mean? He recognized that we were at a particular inflection point in 
human history. I, a, a point at which the child had outgrown the parent or was quickly overtaking the parent. I mean, we had these colonies that had themselves been the beneficiaries of local self-government and of uh, the, the, the idea of limited government. We had benefited from them. Our economy was taking off. We finally had the opportunity, based on economic, demographic, geographic considerations, we finally had the opportunity to throw off our oppressor in a way that no other major civilization on planet Earth had ever had the opportunity to do. So you, you blend all of those fortuitous circumstances uh, with um, the, the, the moment in history when this was happening. He knew something. He could see around this corner. He knew that we were going to set the record straight, that we could and would uh, bring about a successful revolution and one that would serve as an example to the rest of the world. So he was uh, um, he was a classic example of what I would think about uh, when I think about an entrepreneur because in a lot of ways uh, this stuff is incredibly radical in the sense that it's brand new it's different um, most people didn't think this way particularly at the time I, I'm not even sure they think this way today that that the individual was a building block and that that individuals could be trusted to to self govern. And that that wisdom and order came from the bottom up, and he, in in some sense, he's he's standing on the the shoulders of the English common law and the Magna Carta, um, Scottish Enlightenment. There's, there's lots of people thinking important ideas um, for you know hundreds of years before Thomas Paine wrote this. But on the other hand, this this egalitarian radicalism, this this individualism, this this rage against the machine. That's, to me, a uniquely American ethos. Do you think so? Yes, I, I think so. And I think one of the reasons why it was uniquely American, especially at the time, was because elsewhere in the world, uh, there were too many people who were too close to where the power was. Uh, uh, other English subjects, most of them, were either close enough to the king and his base of power or close, uh, close enough to some other part of the world where there were even greater, more oppressive swarms of officers sent forth to harass them and yeah. eat out their substance yeah. uh, than, than there was in America. But because in America, you know, in the decades leading up to the American Revolution, you had had periods of benign neglect by the crown. And as a result, the American people... Um, uh, sort of like the moment when they started riding their bike and didn't realize that the training wheels were no longer on the bike. And they realized, oh my gosh, we can do this. And when we do it ourselves without the training wheels, without mom or dad holding on to the back of the bicycle seat, we can actually do it a lot better. Yeah. Conservatives um, and libertarians and and liberals and progressives, all of these these camps that we sort of self-identify we're constantly having this argument, um, and I'm I'm in I'm in sort of the Thomas Paine camp because when I when I read that sentence, I think he's thinking about um, America as an idea as opposed to America as a place, America as a a particular lineage of of people and culture. Where do you fall in the in the in the argument? Is 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 America fundamentally an idea or is it something else? Well, I I think. America can't exist without the idea that we associate with it. I, I don't think it's possible to identify the idea of America and reproduce it any and everywhere else just by saying, be like America, think like Americans. Culture and customs and history and traditions have to to play a role in that. And that's, that's why, as we've found throughout the world, one, one of the reasons I'm so suspicious of our, um, uh, of the impulse to fight wars everywhere in pursuit of uh, promoting democracy is we, we somehow have this idea that all of a sudden other people are going to produce the same results as the American experiment. Um, that can happen anywhere where liberty is allowed to flourish. But it involves a lot more than simply saying, okay, we hereby adopt this set of principles in our governing document. You have to have a people yearning to be free, yeah. wanting to be free, and willing to uphold a structure that depends on freedom for its existence. It's got to be bottom up. 
Yes. It's it's got to be we the people. Otherwise, any any structure imposed from the top down. And that's what, like a you know generally conservatives are are quite critical of of central planning and and the idea that you could rearrange a complex society or economy um, with the smartest people in the room. But I feel like uh, neoconservatives, anybody that's advocating for regime change, anybody that wants to um, quote spread democracy across the world, it's 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 pretty it's pretty arrogant to think that we could do that. It is. It's terribly arrogant, and it costs. Uh, has cost us trillions of dollars. It has cost us uh, American blood, and it's cost, caused a lot of suffering, not only among our own people, but throughout the world insofar as we have tried to engage in that kind of behavior. And that's why we can't delude ourselves into thinking that um, the thirst for centralization of power is unique to or owned by or, or brought about as a result of either of the two major political parties in this country. Uh, uh, sadly, both political parties have contributed in their own special ways the, to the centralization of power, uh, resulting in a significant loss of liberty. So I, I said earlier that if, if you read this book, you have a, a better context for how Senator Mike Lee votes and the, and the legislation that you sponsor and the fights that you have with your own party. And, and, and one, of the, one of the subjects that you very much tease out here is is I'm I'm going to call it the Fourth Amendment and and privacy and and keeping the government out of your business, but but that goes all the way back to King George. It does. It goes back to King George and even earlier than that, certainly. But in the case of King George III, there were all kinds of things that he did in an effort to cling to power, in an effort to pay for his wars. He had to impose uh, a levy and collect immense taxes. In order to do that, he had to exercise all kinds of government power, kicking down people's doors, authorizing what we call general warrants or or writs of assistance, which basically just empowered his tax collectors and his other law enforcement personnel to barge into people's homes, rifle through their papers, and find out some way in which they weren't complying with the laws of his regime. And it's one of the things that led not only to the Fourth Amendment, but to the revolution, to the Declaration of Independence, and, and to the fact that we became our own country. So, so too much discretion, too many laws, too much power, pretty toxic mix. Toxic mix and an unsustainable mix, especially for a people who had been raised, as most of the people in America had been, with the mindset of liberty and had been given a taste of what it's like to govern themselves. That's, that's what contributed to uh, the opportunity for this revolution to occur in the first place. And it's also one of the things that I think differentiated the American Revolution from the French Revolution. There was a, a culture and a tradition and experience with true liberty that existed on this continent that wasn't found in France prior to their revolution. And that's one of the reasons why ours succeeded where theirs failed. Yeah. Well, let's let's move on to, um, I, I think, Thomas Paine. And, and we'll come back to him maybe because he seems to be the glue that holds this book together. Um, but there's another guy, Sam Adams, that 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 I'm a big fan of. And, and the, the chapter uh, leading up to the Boston Tea Party is fascinating to me. And I think a lot of people get this wrong, like, you know, uh, the, the the, the modern Tea Party would say tax enough already. But but the Boston Tea Party was equally, if not more so, about uh, defending free trade, uh, fighting cronyism. The East India Company, of course, was in cahoots with a with central government with too much power. And, and you know, we always think it was a tax fight, and it, 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 was a, it was a lot more complicated than that. It was really about free trade. Right. It was a tax fight. It was also a monopolistic control fight one that was sponsored by the Crown with the assistance of Parliament, uh, giving a monopoly uh, for the East India Company in the tea trade in America. This really ticked off the American people. It, it upset them greatly and with good reason. It, it would be like going after my beer, like going after tea was, those were fighting words. Right. Uh, so going after your beer, let's say if the federal government today identified one beer maker that was favored by government officials that was then going to be the sole uh, producer and distributor of beer. 
I would imagine the American people, uh, uh, starting uh, with the Kibbe residents, would be quite upset by that. This actually happened in Venezuela, and and it didn't it didn't work out that well because now there's virtually no beer in Venezuela. Yeah, I, I was going to say I'm I'm not a connoisseur of beer like you are, but I'm guessing <laughs> Venezuela is no longer known for their beer. No, as a no. result of that, I, I, I tried one once, and it was it was a pretty horrifying experience. It's like that scene in Good Morning Vietnam. Uh, where there's an exchange about uh, this is the best beer in Vietnam, and somebody said, "Well, it's the only beer in Vietnam." Yeah. And the la- guy later claimed that it had formaldehyde added to it for flavor. Hey, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm uh, getting off track. Uh, well, that that just makes me sad. So, r- right. I mean, wh- why would someone do that? Yeah. Uh, t- uh, to their beverage, but uh, people understood that if the crown continued to move in this direction, it would have devastating effects on people's freedom and on the American economy. And so that's why they orchestrated this economic effort. viability, economic viability. And, and because and, it wasn't just tea, tea was the, 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 the flashpoint because yeah. it was so, it was so important to people. Yeah, it was, it was common. It, it was as, as common as ubiquitous to the time, uh, as, um, as, uh, fine craft beer is in, in the Kibbe residence. You, you mess with their, tea, in your case, you mess with the beer, even though you're messing with other things, that's going to be where the uh, emotional boiling point is quickly reached. Yeah. The, uh, um, and I, you know, I think the, a lot of people today on our side, and I'm using these terms loosely because I'm, I'm not sure who's on each other's side anymore, but, and I, I sort of naively hope that we could all be on the same side on some pretty fundamental things, but, but in many cases, it's who's on first, what's on second. Right. It becomes yeah. Very confusing. And but you know, on, on both sides, actually, this this uh, their skepticism of of trade and the mutual benefits that that you get from uh, Americans focusing on focusing on their comparative advantage, other countries doing that, but but for the American founding. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for trade. It just it just couldn't have happened because we needed we needed the expertise of other countries and and what we had was was resources. We had natural resources. That's exactly right, and that's one of the reasons why in, in the book I tell a story of uh, a, a captain uh, named Thomas Truxton, who was the captain of a of a trade ship uh, called the Charming Polly, and he was arrested uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, as he was engaging in trade, but it, it, and he happened to be doing that uh, in a Dutch island at a moment when the British government had seen fit to impose uh, this, this sweeping prohibition uh, against American trading w- with foreign countries, countries other than Great Britain. Yeah, and they did that because they knew that we could survive if we could trade with other countries. Even if our trade relations were with Britain were messed up, which they clearly were, we could survive and even thrive as long as we could trade with others. They couldn't have that. That's why they tried to shut us down. And that's one of the things that triggered the revolution. And of course, this was the, the problem with the um, getting the colonies to actually come together is that, that certain states, uh, certain colonies were in the tank, like New York. And you know a lot of those those exclusive trading agreements with with England were in fact uh, crony relationships between the crown and and businesses like East India. Of course, because whenever you shut out one person or one group of people from the stream of commerce, it creates a potential beneficiary uh, in someone else. It creates a windfall. And that windfall is allocated not according to economic principles of efficiency and competition, but rather to proximity and favorability to the governing power. And that creates a problem. It's one of the reasons why we ought to be suspicious to this very day of who benefits from government-imposed restraints on trade, from tariffs that end up killing more American jobs than they end up preserving. Yeah. So, so when constitutional conservatives complain about Wall Street bailouts or car bailouts or even uh, farm bailouts uh, required by tariffs, it goes all the way back. This is part of our DNA. It, it is. It is part of human nature. When someone has the power to shut that off, that means they also have the power to favor and benefit uh, those who are not subject to that destructive power. And that can be very tempting. 
especially in a system of government where uh, people's ability to influence government is sometimes tied to and proportionate to their, their economic SWAT. And if their economic SWAT becomes even greater as a result of a government uh, set of regulations, you got a problem. So let's let's talk about the other aspect of the Boston Tea Party, and I think I think this is this is overlooked, but you talk about it in your book. You know, um, everybody knows, even though he was behind the scenes, that that Sam Adams was organizing the Sons of Liberty, uh, training them, and preparing for that that town hall meeting where they eventually go to Boston Harbor and dump tea. The the part of the story that that doesn't get told that often was that. It was, it was essentially an act of, of nonviolent protest. It was the original street theater. And I think it was John Adams would, would come back later and, and say at the time of the Boston Tea Party, the American public was split three ways. Uh, one third was in the tank, one third was true blue, and the other third was trying, and I just butchered the quote, but um, it, you know, they're, they're agnostic. They were like, is this my fight? Do I really care? Um, do I really want to bear the burden of, of fighting for liberty? And it was the nonviolent nature of, of, the, of the Tea Party protest that sort of galvanized the public, particularly um, when the king's response was so violent to it. Yes, uh, that's exactly right. When people here in America could see the extent to which the crown was willing to go, in order to maintain its chokehold on the American economy and on the American people themselves. That's what propelled the revolution. You didn't necessarily all of a sudden get all the people who were in the tank or all the people who were on the fence in with those who, who really felt deeply that we should be our own country. But it was the moment in, in which um, George III lost his legitimacy and, and, and those who were reluctant to support the revolution, realized that it was a lost cause to oppose it uh, because they overreached. Yeah. Uh, King George uh, pushed it too far, and the people would no longer support it. So this entire book, uh, Our Lost Declaration, product placement moment there, is is a series of vignettes of, of all of the pieces of the puzzle that, that led up to this, this amazing moment where, where the, the colonies decided to declare independence. And you spent a lot of time on the politicking um, and all that, and it's, it's, it's remarkable that it ever happened. But, but to me, the, the essential moments are the two we just talked about. The Boston Tea Party was, was an essential moment, and, and the, the popularity of common sense was, the, these were the two things that led the, the people that were in charge, the, the leaders, the founders, the people that usually get all of the credit for the work here, it gave them the courage to actually do the right thing. In fact, it probably forced them to do the right thing even if they didn't actually have enough courage because they, they couldn't not do it at that point. Um, the, the bottom-up nature of this is, is the only way that I think we, we keep America. And, and of course, you and I were, were Tea Partiers. You were a product of the Tea Party. I, I don't know if you've ever told this, but the, the, the process by which you became a U.S. Senator is, is fairly unique in, in American history, at least in my understanding of politics, which is unfortunately too extensive. Um, you were driving a, around in a, um, in a mini camper across the state of Utah talking about the Constitution. That's, Who does that? That's right. Well, I, I, I guess nobody does that. At the time, it seemed perfectly normal to me. Uh, but I had this idea, and initially all this started out um, about 10 years ago when I started giving a series of speeches about federalism and separation of powers across the state of Utah. Um, I decided that I needed to spread the message of the Constitution and of the fact that our, our government in Washington had been ignoring it for some time under the leadership of both political parties. We had been, uh, if you remember the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail, it, it, there's this moment uh, where uh, Sir Galahad comes running, or no, maybe it's Lancelot's, comes running into this castle with his sword drawn. He's about to go in and start killing some people. And there are two guards who are standing there. And as he comes running by with his sword drawn, clearly aiming for an attack, the two armed guards say, hey, you know, I, 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 
as as if they had had noticed it just for the first time, as if they were noticing someone who was coming in violating the dress code. And that's how I felt that our elected representatives in Washington were treating this entire thing. The, the Constitution was being ransacked, and uh, our people who were supposed to be minding the store were just looking as if to say, "Hey," but but not even that. So I started giving these speeches around the state, and eventually those speeches gave rise to what became a U.S. Senate campaign. I was running against a three-term incumbent Republican uh, who was fairly popular, um, but somehow this message worked. Somehow this message resonated. That is that we need a different kind of thinking in Washington, one that refocuses on the fact that there's too much power in Washington. It's being wielded by the wrong people. So equal parts Monty Python and Thomas Paine. Yes, yes, Monty Python uh, and Thomas Paine with occasional references to the 1993 Mike Myers classic, So I Married an Axe Murderer. It's, it's an essential, like if, if people haven't seen that movie, they're, they're probably not fulfilled human beings, I'll be honest. Right, or at least not, not good people. But, yeah. but they, can, they can still repent by seeing it. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but that, that sort of, that, that bottom up ethos. And I, I think, I think people, you, you were the first, you were the first, um, shot heard around the world that, that became the, the Tea Party election of 2010, a, a rebirth of, of respect and, and for the history of, of our constitution and the founding. But, you know, I, I think the political class, particularly Republicans, um, just thought it was weird they didn't recognize this as a quintessentially American thing that we were trying to do. In fact, many of them regarded it, and to some extent may still regard it, as a fundamentally un-American thing. Right. That, that it how dare you? was wrong to have a Republican challenging another Republican. Yeah. Hey, how, how dare you run against someone who uh, wears the same color jersey that we do? Um, and... For some time, they didn't grasp it to a significant degree. This message is now becoming more widespread, and I, I hope that it will become, in time, uh, a message that people uh, at every point along the political continuum can grasp to realize this is not a, a message that's fundamentally Republican or Democratic or even necessarily liberal or conservative, but these principles about how much it makes sense to allow for too much concentration of too much power is a real human concern and something that ought to worry every American. The, uh, the idea of America is, as, as much as we don't like the words um, living constitution, because it, it, it suggests that, that perhaps... Um, some of the fundamental um, limits on government power are negotiable. They're just something that may we decide don't work at some point. But but clearly, um, when I read this book, you're, you're talking about a process to get to an ideal, and we haven't achieved it yet. We're, we're still not quite there. We're never going to be there. Um, and and you you talk specifically about about Jefferson and slavery, and you invoke uh, Dr. Dr. King in the beginning of the book and the end of the book, uh, who would cite the founders? He, he talked about the promissory note of, of the Declaration of Independence. Um, but you get into the history, like Jefferson was, was, was clearly torn by his own behavior and his own business model at Monticello. And, and I, I, didn't, I didn't realize how many times he had actually tried to get the, the legislature in Virginia and the the actual uh, Continental Congress to to go all the way. Let let's abolish this this obscene thing that's happening in America. Because if we don't, it'll tear us apart. Give us give us the history yeah. of that. It's it's really interesting stuff. I explain in the book that starting uh, at an early moment in his political career as a member of the territorial uh, of the colonial legislature in Virginia, he tried to make slavery unlawful. He recognized that it was wrong. Uh, he uh, was met, of course, with a lot of resistance on that, and ultimately that effort failed. And it also failed when he tried to work into the Declaration of Independence. His initial draft um, used as part of his indictment against against King George III, 
the fact that the king had perpetuated the slave trade and had uh, that he and his predecessors had sort of um, uh, forced slavery on the American people and that it was a problem. Now, look, as I point out in the book, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not a Thomas Jefferson sycophant. Uh, I'm not going to praise Thomas Jefferson in the same way that I praise uh, Thomas Paine and others in the book because obviously his actions weren't all that consistent with his words in many instances. It still is worth mentioning, nonetheless, that he tried to get that end of the declaration. He knew it was wrong, and he tried to make it unlawful. He also tried to make it a, a part of our, um, our, our opening mission statement in the declaration that we're not a, a slave-owning country. Uh, he lost that battle, but in the process, I think he planted the seeds for what would become an effort to free African slaves in America. Yeah, both Abraham Lincoln and, and Dr. Martin Luther King would would reference Jefferson's words as, as unfinished business. Right, right. Um, in, in fact, uh, even the language that remained, now the, the, the language that was omitted was very overt and explicit in its condemnation of slavery. But even the language that remained, just the fact that he acknowledged that uh, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those things themselves were incompatible with slavery. I think Jefferson knew that, and I think he knew that he was helping move the, the freedom process forward. So what do you say to critics who argue that, that founders like Jefferson as slaveholders were, were illegitimate as architects of America's founding? Um, you you probably don't agree with that, but but what what is the the conservative response to that critique? It is very natural for us to condemn them for doing what they did because it is abhorrent. That doesn't mean that they didn't know that what they were doing was wrong. In Jefferson's case, it was abundantly clear. It is abundantly clear to us to this day that he knew what he was doing was wrong. He felt uh, uh, that he was somehow powerless to do anything about it. Um, we are understandably very critical of that. Uh, and in Jefferson's case in particular, we can point out, and I point out in the book, that uh, unlike Washington, Jefferson didn't even make provisions uh, to allow his slaves to be freed after his death. And in fact, in the case of Jefferson, um, because of the way his estate was set up, uh, his slaves were sold after he died. And in many cases, families were split up and sent to different parts of the country. That doesn't change the fact that the words that he penned in the Declaration of Independence and in the drafts leading up to it, they still were true. They still expressed these eternal truths that are still relevant today. And those same truths, uh, in part because they were expressed as well, um, however hypocritically, as they were by him in the Declaration, they still were true, and they still helped make a difference in American history. So the idea is legitimate, and and even though um, the people were flawed human beings, um, it's it's kind of hard to get past the flawed human being part because that's that is the human experience. Like we're always not perfect. Yeah, that that is exactly right, and and. And I actually think this helps make the case for liberty rather than against it. Um, we look to the fact that Jefferson, as revered as he is in this country and as great as his contribution was, he also did some things that we regard as utterly abhorrent. It's one of the reasons why we should avoid uh, the, the, the worship uh, of any individual and why we should avoid the worship of the state, why we should avoid uh, unfailing, unflinching deference to any government. Jefferson was the government. He, he helped create uh, the United States as an independent nation. He himself later served as president of the United States. And he himself is an example of why we shouldn't give any one person too much power. So we've tried to rehabilitate uh, populism as, as meaning from the people. We've spent a little bit of time uh, rehabilitating egalitarian, which 
to you and I probably means equal treatment under law instead of the arbitrary rule of a king. Uh, let's rehabilitate democracy. I, I call myself a radical Democrat, and 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 Jefferson was as well, and 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 arguably naively so. But if 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 it's not just about voting fifty one to forty nine percent to take somebody else's stuff, but it's it's this entire bottom up model where all of us have a responsibility um, to take a little bit of time and and care about the American model, to defend the American model, to care about the deep state. Um, Where are you um, on this debate between democracy and and republicanism? We're not a democracy. We're a republic. And, uh, you know, I as a kid, it irritated me that public school teachers during the 1970s and 80s seemed to have to um, uh, redefine every term. And I always, I'm always mindful of the need to not come across sounding too much like them. Teachers of that era were fond of saying, you can't call it recess, it's break. You can't call it show and tell, it's sharing time. They had new names for everything. And so sometimes I hesitate a little bit to... Uh, make clear that I don't regard democracy as an accurate description of our system of government or even the system of government we aspire toward. It nonetheless needs to be said from time to time, especially where it's brought up as it is here. There is a fundamental distinction between a democracy and a republic. In a republic, you've got at the outset an understanding that government has limited power. There's something that limits the power of what government can do and how it may do it. In a democracy, it's the pure expression of the uh, majority rule. And one of the reasons why I think a republic is a better form of government than a democracy is because within a republic, it's easier to balance the the countervailing competing interests of equality and liberty. Those two things, history suggests, can more effectively keep each other in check as the yin and yang of the political world in a republic than they can in a democracy. In a pure democracy, radical egalitarianism, equality run amok, ends up swallowing liberty. Equality of outcomes. Equality of outcomes. Yeah. People become so obsessed. That, That, by the way, is another reason why the French Revolution failed to produce a sustainable liberty model is because... They focus so much on equality, equality, equality of outcomes, as opposed to equality understood, properly understood, which in my view is um, subjecting all citizens to equal treatment under a just system of laws. That's very different than equality of outcomes. E- e- if it is equal treatment under a just system of laws, equally applicable to all people, that can live in, an, in harmony with liberty. If it's radical egalitarianism, equality of outcome mandated by government, that will swallow liberty every time. I'm probably abusing the language, but I would I would consider egalitarian to mean your definition that it's equal treatment under a, a just system. Um, but, but but we can debate those things. But of course, uh, Ben Franklin supposedly said after the uh, was the signing of the Declaration or the Constitution, I believe it was, where he said, uh, "What what have we a Republican?" If you can keep it, um, to me that's a that's a call to arms to the people. It's like I'm done. I've done what I can do. Uh, the founders did what they could do, but but you people, it's on you. I've always loved the fact that he said that that he called it a republic rather than a democracy, and that he said, "If you can keep it," rather than "If I can keep it" or "If we can keep it." He said, "If you can keep it." it you're exactly right. It was his mic drop moment. Yeah, Franklin by that time was an old man. He could see that he wasn't going to be around forever. He didn't have political aspirations to run the government beyond that point. Um, And he acknowledged that it would be up to the people generally. It would be up to the people as a whole to decide whether or not they could keep it. And and you believe that. That's why you wrote this book. Um, uh, What's uh, the, the book comes out on Tuesday, which means yesterday when by the time people see this. Right. Wrap your head it's sort around of a that. Zen-like yeah. thought, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, day after tomorrow, which means yesterday. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Sort of like how on Venus they say the atmosphere is so thick that uh, light bends in such a way that if you could stand on the surface of Venus, you could see the back of your head. I don't know that we'll ever know. Is that the next book? Y- yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Seeing the back of your head on Venus. I, I won't be reading that one. 
Um, but I definitely but, won't be reading it because I don't like the side of my the back of my head. Yeah, it reminds me of my balding. Stairs. Where do people pick up this this sweet new book? Um, I, I got a pre copy here, so it's probably worth a bunch on eBay, but. Where can people buy our lost declaration? You can buy it at Amazon.com. You can buy it at Barnes and Noble. Uh, you can buy it at many other places where books are commonly bought and sold. But uh, uh, for for most people, I think more, more more people today buy books through Amazon than any other vendor, and so that's uh, where many find it. You can find the um, the hardcover, the audiobook, or the ebook uh, at each of those outlets. And people have been warned that if you read this book, you're probably going to feel a little bit more responsibility to get off your butt and do something about defending this country. Yes, but more importantly, Matt, they will feel liberated. They will feel um, freed by the constraints that bind us today, where we're in this mindset that we have to depend on government. We don't. The government does knows best. It doesn't. We do. This book is empowering. It's, I mean, one last thing, and I, I was going to bring this up, and I, I, I forgot about it, but I've been obsessed about this speech you gave. I think it was a Federalist Society in November, um, and, and it gets to this point because the, the, the colonies really didn't have that much in common, and they spent all their time fighting with each other. You talk about that in the book, and there's a lesson in there today where, where politics is trying to divide us based on, based on, based on the color of our skin, sexual preference, religion. Uh, where we come from, where our parents came from, all that stuff. And, and you argue that the, the genius of the American system is that we don't all have to be the same. And, and the only way you can tolerate people not being the same is by limiting the power of the federal government. Right. Because we've learned through sad experience that people do bad stuff to people who are not them, to people who don't look like them, who live in a different neighborhood than they do. And we've learned through sad experience that people will inevitably use the levers of government uh, to mistreat those around them if we allow for a system of government to be used that way. If we properly understand what government is and what it isn't, if we properly understand why we have government to begin with, and that one of the reasons we need government is to allow us to, 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 to prevent us from descending into that type of chaos will be better served. We've lost sight of some of that. And, and we've, we've descended into this awful feedback loop of uh, allowing people to see everything even within our own society as an us versus them, uh, uh, this region versus that. If you limit the amount of damage government can do at the outset, both with your philosophy and your governing documents, you won't descend into that abyss. Let's leave it there. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.